Well, let's get started. So again, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Arne Van Alstrud. I'm the global head of the KCS Academy, and I'm pleased to introduce uh, Jill McCormick and Melissa Leslie. And Jill and Melissa are both uh, knowledge program managers at Parsons, and they're going to describe how they were able to deploy KCS to the enterprise. And they had some uh, unique approaches that I think we'll all benefit from. And uh, Jill's going to present the slides, and then Melissa will monitor the chat, and then both uh, Jill and Melissa will be available for Q&A at the end. And some uh, housekeeping before we begin, this session is being recorded and will be posted on the consortium site for members, as well as sent out to all who registered. And I, um, there's so many great uh, nuggets in this. I'll be doing a, a blog on this and also linking to the uh, uh, the present, uh, the recording. So you'll have, see that coming out uh, in the future also. And while you are not speaking, please put yourself on mute. And um, also we have several KCS webinars coming up in the next couple of months and encourage you all to register. And Jennifer will be our community success manager. Jennifer Morcat will be posting the link in chat. And it's always uh, great to hear about uh, digital transformations happening in this broader community. And when I say digital transformations, whether you're um, deploying a, a KCS uh, implementation, community, you're doing uh, uh, automated support, any type of digital transformation, we'd love to hear about the successes, the strategies and, and tips, um, as well as the ditches people encountered and how to avoid them. So if you'd like to present at a future case case in action, please out, reach out to me and I'll get you on the calendar. And I'm gonna post my contact information in chat shortly. But I'm very excited about today's event and pleased to pass it over to the Parsons team. Great, thank you. All right, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Jill McCormack. I work at Parsons along with um, Melissa Leslie who were the knowledge program managers. And so I'll start just by telling you a little bit about um, who Parsons is as a company. Um, we are a defense intelligence and critical infrastructure solutions provider. And we've been in business for more than 77 years at this point. Um, we're a global company with a presence in North America, Canada, the Middle East, and many areas in Europe and Asia, as you can see. Uh, we employ more than 15,000 employees globally, and uh, we serve lots of markets, including aviation, bridges, cyber, federal infrastructure, rail and transit, road and highway, geospatial, to name just a few, as you can see. So that's just kind of an overview of who Parsons is, but now we want to kind of take the time to dive into what we've been facing internally. Um, and share that with you. So in 2018, a big challenge that we had was that knowledge for employees was real siloed, it was outdated, and it was often scattered through various places. Um, knowledge was often either in, in people's heads or on their desktops, and we had to track it down or you know, wait on people's vacation schedules or availability to get access to the information. So um, you know, we were also relying on employees' ability to navigate our intranet internally to find the information, and that was costing them time and frustration, and they often didn't find the most accurate information, so it was a real problem. So to address the issue, um, a handful of IT employees were selected to set up a knowledge program using the KCS methodology to manage a centralized knowledge base using Salesforce and a tool called Catalyst Concierge. And that was gonna be our self-help portal for employees to access. Uh, at the time, we had a small understaffed help desk with long hold times. So uh, the immediate goal for our knowledge base was that it be used in-house by Parsons employees to self-solve. So that was our initial goal. Uh, seven people were selected to get KCS certified and spearhead the whole knowledge program. But after a few months, there was a death, a resignation, bandwidth constraints, and basically that whittled down to three. <laughs> so the three of us set out to take 20 years, basically, of user guides, online help systems, tech tips, 
and other IT content and turn it into the beginnings of a knowledge base. Okay, so you might be asking, how did we determine which content to migrate over? Um, basically, our methodology for this was that we met with help desk managers to capture the top trending calls. Um, for example, we knew that like resetting your password was the number one call to the IT help desk. Um, benefits questions were the number one call to the HR help desk. And so, you know, we absolutely wanted to capture those as self-solve articles to be there at launch. Um, we also analyzed our SharePoint metrics because that's what we had been previously using for what was being accessed in doc libraries on our intranet. And then finally, we just made some good old fashioned educated guesses based on known issues that we had as being employees ourselves and working there for quite a long time. Uh, so, you know, we knew we weren't launching our knowledge base with a full set of articles, and that was okay. Um, we knew from the beginning we were going to be starting small and adding as we go, per the KCS methodology. So off we went. Uh, we developed a vision and a strategic framework, a content standard, you know, a training and rewards and recognition program to motivate and incentivize our participants. Um, we had buy-in from leadership. We had an article template developed in Salesforce Knowledge based on the KCS methodology. Um, and we had pre-populated a few hundred articles at that point. So once we had the start of our knowledge base, it was now time to communicate to our employees that they would be able to start finding self-service support in our new tool, Concierge. And it would save them time if they were having an issue or needed an answer so that they could just get back to work. Um, so we designed their experience in concierge so that they didn't need to worry about what department or category something falls into, like if it's HR, IT, or legal, for instance. Um, basically, you know, there was, there was established record types in Salesforce for us to leverage on, on the backside, but the consumers of the content in concierge weren't going to care about who owned the content, who owned the content. They just wanted their answers. So we set it up that way. So um, here's what an article in our Salesforce environment today looks like. Um, so this is uh, the, the template that we use to create the articles according to either external or internal audience types. So this is how we determine um, you know, who can see it. If internal articles are, they're just for licensed service console users only. So you have to have a, a specific license in Salesforce in order to see this knowledge tool, um, but external articles are gonna surface in concierge for all employees to see. So if a help desk agent is capturing a solution, uh, he or she can keep it internal for their peers or as like a work in progress until the content's trusted enough to benefit employees for self-service. So then once it's trusted, it can be changed to external. And then this whole process interfaces really well with cases in Salesforce, which is um, the tool that our help desk agents use to manage tickets and then where they attach their articles to cases. This is what concierge looks like in our environment. Um, you know, when we initially rolled it out, like I said, we designed the experience so that employees could search for any topic, regardless of the department, and even log a ticket if they didn't find the solution they needed. Um, but then, like I said, on the back end in Salesforce knowledge, our knowledge workers would set up the articles based on record type so that if a ticket did need to be logged, it would get routed to the right team. Um, so through concierge, employees can get help by searching for solutions, calling the help desk and their numbers listed there, using live chat or logging a ticket. Uh, when we launched, Emailing the help desk was discontinued because in our environment, it could take more than three days to get a response um, by email and up to 10 days or more to solve an issue by email. So we advertised that searching in concierge and um, then using one of these other method methods was the fastest way to get support. So in addition to the traditional KCS knowledge creation, uh, associated with cases. 
We also monitor various search reports daily. Um, we have open two-way communication with our employees by creating or enhancing articles based on the key terms they use to search. Um, when they, when also when we receive zero search results or when they receive zero search results and through article feedback. Um, so we, you know, we publish a list of trending searches weekly, like the one you're seeing here, and we reach out to teams or SMEs to help develop or enhance content based on the feedback that we're getting in the interaction. So word um, has spread and teams are asking, hey, how can I contribute content to concierge also? So, um, you know, shortly after we launched cybersecurity, jumped in and joined and started adding their content. Um, and then we were approached by facilities uh, for help centralizing theirs. Um, as an example, what they were going through, facilities had, they used to have a three ring binder for their facilities coordinators in the various offices all over the world. So um, it was difficult distributing updated policies and procedures and it really made in office support inconsistent. It was just not a, a great situation. Um, but now they have one in place where information is you know, located and introduced, and then there's a service queue to enhance their support throughout the enterprise. So it has just been greatly improved. Um, and then our most recent addition that we're really excited about is the safety team. And so, you know, as confidence in concierge is climbing. Um, we know more and more teams are asking how they can contribute and add content to our knowledge base. Okay, so when someone does want to participate in knowledge, um, we've made it permission based to enforce methodology. Um, so what we do is we grant permissions after demonstrated competency is met through our in-house training program. Um, our goal is to get all knowledge workers to editor at a minimum, since this is when true collaboration can happen. Um, so in order for a department to get their own record type, like facilities did, um, then they have to have a minimum of one knowledge domain expert certified by the KCS Academy certified trainer. Uh, we personally happen to like Michelle Stump from Upland Right Answers, giving her a shout out. Um, so we send all our KDE candidates through her class. Um, so the way we have it set up, KDEs approve external articles, which then publish to concierge. Um, but in our environment, all roles can publish internally. So those don't need an AQI score. I believe now it's called the content standard score and um, they aren't viewable by all employees. So the way we have it set up in our environment, rights for publishing are given to the KDE only. Um, so publishers gain additional responsibilities to do scoring, and then we ask them to do metrics and help us with kind of just really monitoring the knowledge base overall. Um, so just kind of as a side note, along our journey through KCS and implementing our knowledge program, um, we discovered that having KDE and coach combined was a better method for us than having a standalone coach position. It just worked better in our environment. Okay, so uh, in the beginning, when we had that small group of us that were asked to get KCS certified and put a knowledge program together, um, we recruited and activated around 35 knowledge workers who helped create approximately, I think we had three, about 340 articles in anticipation of our launch. Um, today, we have around 275 knowledge workers certified at one of those four levels that I showed you, um, including 21 help desk agents, which is the size of our IT help desk and more than 1,600 articles and growing in our knowledge base. So that's pretty good in two years. So since 2019, uh, we've achieved some really exciting milestones that we have celebrated. Um, last year in June of 2020, uh, which was a little over a year after we launched, we hit half a million searches in concierge. And so two years after that, after our launch, um, we, we say we joined the likes of McDonald's and Amazon serving up over 1 million searches. 
Um, so we were tracking call and case deflection. Um, but as we all are so familiar with the April 2020 hit with COVID, and so our data got a little skewed because we had to figure out how to move 15,000 um, people to a work from home situation. So our timeline has this anomaly in it um, that perhaps makes it look a bit different than a normal year. But many of our managers agree that uh, we could not have moved that many employees from uh, to home during a quarantine like this without, without concierge. So that's, that's a, a good success. Um, here's just a dashboard that we have built in Salesforce that um, demonstrates some of that success. Um, you can see that before COVID hit, and a few months after our launch, you know, we had around 6,000 searches. It's pretty good. Um, but then when employees were looking for work for, from home instructions, our searches spiked to almost 36,000. And that's actually an average that has remained since April of 2020. So um, we were definitely glad that we had gone ahead and launched when we did so that content was readily available in our, in our self-help portal and we could update content on the fly as needed during that transition time. All right, so um, this is to show how our concierge platform gives our employees an opportunity for um, feedback. So, so this is kind of our, our two-way street that I, that I mentioned earlier, and it, and it helps us keep the articles accurate. So they can report errors or issues by clicking that link um, down at the bottom of an article that you can see. And then we take that input and we make updates as needed. So um, we, we, what we do in-house is we create a case from the feedback so we can track it and ensure that it gets addressed. Um, we typically inform the person who submitted the feedback, um, you know, what action we took based on their feedback, which helps maintain a good reputation overall of concierge. And, and that is our goal. Our main goal is that concierge have a good um, um, reputation as a trustworthy resource. So responses to the feedback have really gone a long way in helping us do that. Um, us acknowledging their observations and letting them know that a real person has received it and will take action has, has been a part of that success. Uh, here's an example of how that cycle helps us improve the articles. Just kind of a quick look at a glance that um, when someone uses the no here's why button in an article and gives us that feedback, um, an, a knowledge worker responds and makes those updates accordingly. Um, and then the updates are published and the cycle continues. We do uh, monitor the feedback, like I said, and search results daily. Um, knowledge articles are created, of course, as a byproduct of those search results and cases. Um, articles are improved as a result of feedback, as well as interaction, and then our scheduled reviews that we have built in. Um, the cycle of using concierge as a centralized portal has really appealed to other teams which has prompted requests for them to engage with the program and become knowledge workers and get involved. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, if there's an uptick in searches for something specific, like say um, an issue with logging on to Outlook, for example, um, we can ensure that there's an article that provides the steps to fix it. And then we can communicate that through internal channels um, like our, in our intranet sites. Um, so what's interesting about this, the way that this works is that oftentimes the KDEs that, that we're, we're monitoring the feedback and all that, we're going to typically report um, problems to the help desk before the SMEs or the tool owners can even report it. So, you know, it's, it's a pretty um, a responsive uh, program with a lot of people engaged. Hey, Jill. Yeah, sorry to interrupt your flow, but we've, we've got a question here. Um, Catherine asked about how we ensure consistency and keep content up to date, which you addressed. Um, but she's also asking what people strategies we've used to, and I'm, I'm assuming this is to keep people engaged in the knowledge base. Um, do you wanna kind of go in a little bit more on our in, um, review or our, um, our uh, rewards program and, and how we, we pull people into the knowledge base? 
Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, so that training, uh, the, the, the roles that I showed, we have a training program um, that they have to go through. I think, let me see if I can just quickly find that same slide that shows our, here we go. Um, uh, it shows right here that for each level, each role level, as they level up, they get, um, sorry, that they have, these are the requirements, two one hour classes, and then they have to pass a little five question quiz. And it's just a scenario based quiz to confirm they really understand the methodology. So at each role, they have to go through these. Um, at the author level, we give out a certificate um, that we just mail to them, you know, print it on a, a, some like thicker cardstock. And so we just, we just do all this in house and print out a, a certificate. And then um, for editor, we, we give them another certificate. We um, send them a $25 Starbucks gift card and a medal. Like I, I think I used um, crownawards.com, you know, to, to purchase these medals and you can um, get, get something printed on them. And then um, at the publisher level, we do a little bit more celebrating with them to appreciate all that they've invested. And we give them a $50 Visa gift card and a cute little trophy and another certificate. So um, that's basically, is, does that answer the question, kind of how we reward them? Was that really what they were asking? Yep, that was absolutely okay. what she was asking. Yeah, that's how we set it up. We, we were able to, you know, get a little bit of budget for some of the tchotchkes and stuff. But um, I think, you know, just really trying to acknowledge and appreciate and value their time and investment into the training, um, I, I think goes a long way. In, in any way that you can as a company. Okay, let me bounce back to where we were. Um, that was a great question. I'm, I'm glad you asked. We were, we were always um, on these webinars when we were attending, still getting going. I remember we were always very keen on finding out, okay, how did you do the training program? <laughs> um, okay, so at this point, um, you know, as we step back and we're kind of looking for the differentiators that have, that have helped our knowledge program, um, we believe that following the methodology, the KCS methodology has certainly been key, but that adapting it to our own environment is important as well. So, um, you know, kind of knowing when to flex and when not to flex, like when we merged the KCS coach role with KDE, that was um, when we could flex. But I'm going to show you on a lessons learned where we learned not to flex. <laughs> um, another important distinction has been uh, that we, you know, we provide articles in front of change as well. So in addition to just in time content versus just in case, um, we we have dedicated communications team teams here at Parsons for various different groups. Like we have an IT communications team an HR communications team. Um, and that, you know, we, we are basically working on preparing business readiness content. And so, you know, we send out email notifications communicating that like there's a new platform or a policy for instance, um, you know, but those, those communications are backed up with links to concierge articles that have instructions or answers that can be referenced 24 seven from any device, any location. Um, you know, and it gives us an opportunity to get feedback from them. So, um, you know, that's, that's a good differentiator, I believe. And then um, also we used to push our news. So we would push news, changes, outage notifications um, to the applicable audiences and just kind of hope that they read those. But, you know, with concierge, um, you know, now we, we still email the information, but it's more poll information because it's backed by that content in concierge that's, that's always there for them when they need it and they need to refer to it. Um, some of our future goals and, and enhancements that we have on the radar, um, certainly getting our articles translated into other languages because we are a global co uh, company. Um, we wanna continue working with some of the new tools um, like Power BI that we have just um, in, in implemented to build better dashboards and help us with that real tangible metrics um, and, and helps point us to that continuous improvement side of the loop. 
Uh, and then, you know, increase alignment with the help desk to make sure that cases are being linked accurately. We're still keeping, you know, a pretty close eye on that. And then um, here's some lessons learned that we wanted to share with you. Um, a couple of these, like I said, are, are where we learned that you shouldn't flex on the me methodology. Um, like um, number two, but I'll get to that in a second. The first one, not giving the knowledge base enough time to mature internally before we launched it to employees. You know, that just kind of, those were our circumstances. Um, although those did end up paying off since, you know, the timing of COVID hit and we really needed to have a way to instruct 15,000 employees how to work from home. So that one paid off. Um, but, you know, it would have been good if our, if our knowledge base could have matured a little bit more before we launched it. Um, we did learn that the requirements for the training program that we put in place should not be compromised. Um, so we're pretty hard nosed about making sure that like I explained earlier where um, you've got those two one hour classes and that five question quiz for each of the levels. Um, everybody has to go through that who wants to be a knowledge worker and participate in the program and everybody who wants to have an, their own record type um, has to have at least one KDE and we just don't flex on that, no matter who it is I mean we've had some executives come through the training even because um, we're not going to give any exceptions. We want everyone to understand the case as methodology um, and how we're implementing it here. So that's, that's one of those areas. Um, certainly uh, insight that we've gained since launch has shown that some of the fields in that template that I show you, showed you um, weren't fully vetted out when we launched and we could probably improve how they're being used an uh, example of that is our article maturity field. Um, and, and so now we're, we're actually in the process of trying to vet out how that should um, be improved. Um, we also now encourage all of our developers that are working with Salesforce to understand the methodology and go through a basic level of KCS training. Um, we had uh, someone on the development team in the past who didn't understand the methodology. And that was a really challenging way for us to uh, work together. Um, also, we noticed from search trends that employees sometimes think concierge is Google. <laughs> um, so we see some interesting searches and we, we try to educate our folks on you know, what concierge is and what it isn't through all of our various internal communication channels. Um, and then lastly, you know, we did a survey, but the timing wasn't good and we got a low response rate. It was kind of right after COVID hit. So we need to do another survey and really keep tabs on the pulse of how our employees are, are perceiving things overall and how they're going. Okay, so that is really um, kind of the summary of our journey with KCS so far. Um, wherever you are on your path to implement it, it. I hope that you found some nuggets here today that were helpful or that encourage you in your KCS endeavors. And so if there are any other questions, I think at this point we could open it up if there's time. We have a good question, Jill. Uh, um, uh, can, and I know we've, we've done a little bit of this, but it says, can you please share how we, we motivate knowledge workers to invest their time in knowledge creation and maintenance? How, did, how do we build knowledge management culture within our team? Yeah, you're not gonna leave that for me to answer, are you? <laughs> you, you take so, a stab at it. I responded just, you know, at the top, you know, we, we had, um, you know, pretty strong leadership um, support for this, yeah. uh, primarily because, you know, we we were seeing long, long wait times for resolution, uh, both on on the on the phone through email, uh, just in general. Uh, you know, and I, I was seeing stat, I'm seeing stats where we've reduced that um, that wait time to resolution by more than 50 percent here in the last year. Um, I think one of the biggest things that helped with the building a knowledge management culture is, you know, we had a few folks who didn't want to participate. Um, 
they felt that their the knowledge in their head is what kept them valuable to the company, um, which I'm sure each of you have have witnessed that as you're trying to roll out your knowledge program. Uh, but we had one person who we convinced to create an article because he had vast knowledge that was very helpful. And he had what, what he called Outlook templates. And he would just create that Outlook template and send it to somebody who had a question. So it just lived on his desk or in his head. Um, we encouraged him to take one of those and put it in knowledge just, just to you know, humor us. And I would say, what was it, Jill? Within about a month, he had 5,000 views of that one article. Mm -hmm. and, and and he you know reported back he's like I don't have people asking me questions I don't have people bothering me I can focus on these other things this is amazing and he became one of our biggest cheerleaders and all of those outlook templates became knowledge articles uh, and and he's focusing on things that he wants to focus on not you know repeated support questions uh, so you know having people share those wins um, seeing those views seeing where they're helping the the company seeing where they're helping employees um, you know, all of the things that we learn in training that that this methodology will give us, um, you know, our, our folks are seeing, which is is building that knowledge management culture. Yeah, that's a great answer. You're right. That was a great example of success around here. We have an, another question about uh, what benefits we experienced by combining the coach and KDE roles. And, and I know that that coaching program has been one of our our biggest hurdles. So maybe you can kind of go into some of what lessons learned we with that and you know why we're where we're at. Yeah, so for us, um, when we, it, it, I just kept hearing from people, you know, I don't have time. <laughs> because what we're asking of coaches is that you've got to make a commitment, you've got to make a time commitment to um, you know, at least follow up with these folks that we're assigning you to as a coach and, you know, make sure that um, they're doing okay. And so we were asking for a minimum commitment of, I think it was three to five hours a, a week and, and people were just tapped out. They're like, you know, I'm so sorry. I would love to help with that, but I, I just can't. And so um, we just kind of kept running into these walls. I mean, people would get excited about it, but then it would trail off. So uh, I would say, you know, for us, it was really more of, of understanding in depth how we were acting as KDEs and then somebody kind of just pointing out, you know, that's really sort of coaching too, right? I mean, it was it's just sort of some light bulb moments where we recognize that um, you know it's it's okay if we've got our structure set up this way and we've kind of already named them what we've named them. You know, we have author, editor, publisher, and um, it may not seem as intuitive. Maybe is the right way to say that um, from just the perspective of like outside looking in, for knowing the the KCS recommended role names. But um, I don't know, we, it just, it's just working. I'm not exactly sure how to articulate that. Um, we just found that as KDEs that we've all sort of got this sense of ownership and responsibility where we're really invested and we're really paying close attention and we're, we're watching. I've got this big, huge tracking spreadsheet of everybody, everybody's training, um, who's attended training, you know, when. And so we'll reach out to them occasionally and just talk about, you know, hey, you know, we'd love for you to take the next class and, and then the quiz so we can get that certification to you and we can get you engaged in the knowledge program. And um, so as, as we're doing that as KDEs to be the champions for the program, we kind of realized, you know what, we're really doing coaching too. So I, I don't know, it's just, it's just kind of evolved into that in our, in our own environment. That probably didn't really answer the question Exactly, but <laughs> I don't know. What else can you add, Melissa? Anything to enhance that? I'm not sure if I can add anything to enhance that. I, you know, the, I think everybody knows that biggest challenge is I just don't have time. Yeah. Um, but you know, as we get more people involved, we we do hear that they have more time, and and we see them, you know, investing a lot more time in the articles that they've created or the articles that they're touching. Yeah. Um, I, and I think we have a, a question about our coach mentee ratio. I don't, I'm not sure if, if we've 
you know, if we have that, other than I think we've got 12, 12 KDEs, or is it 15 now? No, we have 12. We have 12 KDEs total um, out of those. That's a good question because I forgot to include that in my slide. So out of the 275 um, active knowledge workers that we have, we do have 12 KDEs. And um, so that's that looks like, you know, there's seven for IT, two for HR, one for cyber, one for facilities. And then we just got two um, joined, that joined us for safety. And so did I miss anybody? I think that's it. And so um, since we are, we, we, since we merged them, we're just actively monitoring daily, regularly, hourly. You know, we're, we're really invested and involved in um, the articles that are submitted for review and approval and the review dates as they come up. We actively go and say, hey, your article's up for review. Um, please take a look and, you know, let us know if, or, or change it if, if it needs changed or, or update the review date. And so we're, we're pinging people, we're engaging people a lot. And I think um, we just kind of do that side of it as we do our knowledge articles, more of, you know, of a, of an, not as needed because we're still being really proactive, but we're, um, we're just staying really engaged. So I, I don't have like a specific number or a ratio for you on that one. Sorry. <laughs> okay, um, there is a question. I got to scroll up to the top because it was a good one that I wanted to talk through. And they're coming through really fast. So I'm sorry if I missed a couple. Um, and this goes back to your, your communication theme slide, I'm pretty sure, but it's just how, how do you keep on top of change, community, community discussions, core knowledge needs? Um, you know, we have a dedicated IT communications staff, which is me and Jill and two other women. Um, and then there's a dedicated security communication staff. There's a dedicated HR communication staff. We all meet pretty regularly and we have built knowledge creation and concierge into our change management plan. Um, and so, you know, we are, we're all active in our, we, we use workplace as our oh, it's social or business social media. So we're, you know, yeah. keeping up on questions that are being asked there. Uh, we're keeping up with each other on uh, communications programs, you know, what, what's coming out, big, big changes from security or big changes from HR, um, you know, and, and making sure that the, the concierge and the search environment is prepared for, for those, those core changes and, and that. Uh, and then, as we said earlier in the presentation, we, we monitor search daily. So, um, you know, as, as we see, you know, what one side of the country calls a share drive, the other side of the country calls it something different. So, you know, as we see those, those influx and changes in how people search, but the answer is the same, you know, we're enhancing our articles or enhancing our, our promoted search terms or, you know, making sure that their answers are being met based on, on how they're using these tools. Good question. And we had another. We had another question about uh, you know the methodology says not to focus on re review dates, but it sounds like we are. We made that decision um, primarily because a good majority of our our knowledge base is internal. It's that internal record type. Uh, so you know a lot of, of of articles are created in response to a case, but they're not quite ready to for the employees to use to so self solve. Uh, a lot of things are created, you know, based on an emergency and uh, they were just sitting out there stale. You know, we, we were going through our knowledge base and seeing things that were created in 2018, just in case, you know, before rollout. So by having that review date, it brings it to the, the KDE's attention that, that it's out there. It hasn't been touched. It hasn't been updated. It hasn't been attached to a case. Um, and that just gives us a chance to just review and, and validate the life cycle of that article. Does it need to be enhanced? Does, you know, has the tool changed? Um, it, is it even needed anymore? Um, so it, it's not a huge part of, you know, the article update, but it, it does help ensure that we don't have anything that sits out there stale or out there that isn't needed or out there that should be found, but isn't being found. 
Mm -hmm. But if you remember when I, the, one of the first slides was about the problem that we started with before we launched our knowledge base, which was that our content was super hard to find. It was outdated, it was siloed. And so our review date has been pivotal for us in our environment to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And that remember the reputation that our goal is that the concierge reputation is that it's trustworthy. So between those two things, not wanting the information to go stale and outdated and be untrustworthy and that goal for concierge, um, we rely pretty heavily on the review date, like she said, to bring to the knowledge managers, the KDE's attention that this needs some a review. So that's how we're using it. Really great questions. We have a question. Who are the biggest contributors to the knowledge base? Is it a support group or other departments within the company? Um, I would say it's it's a representation across the company, wouldn't you, you Jill? I mean, it's, it's IT support desk, it's IT and user computing. Um, mm -hmm. It's HR, um, our benefits team. Mm -hmm. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's across the board. Yeah, I think we've got a dashboard that shows us the kind of content that's coming in. I mean, certainly in Salesforce, if, if you're familiar with, that you can do list views so we can filter and kind of just, you know, jump in and go see who's contributing, um, like what groups. But yeah, I would say there's, there's a, a pretty big range and like safety now coming in, they're going to have uh, you know, some, some very different content as well um, when they start contributing. Facilities probably doesn't have as big of a presence of articles um, just because the nature of what they're doing. I mean, you, you've got like office lease stuff, the court, you know, stuff the coordinators are doing, logistics, you know, maybe badges, things like that. Um, but maybe not quite as heavy, but yeah, I mean, there's just a, a huge variety of teams. And what's great is, you know, um, service desk, uh, help desk contributes, but they're really um, doing a lot of, of monitoring and updating because they're leveraging the content that other tier groups have um, developed for, for them to use to answer questions when they get calls. And so, you know, the escalations aren't happening as much. That first call resolution is, is happening more. It's increased. So... You know, we also see, we've seen a lot of interest outside of, you know, they're not quite knowledge workers yet, but, um, you know, folks from our trade compliance and folks, you know, from, you know, security, just to ensure that, you know, we're meeting the, the language requirements for certain things within the company. Yeah, that's a good point. And related to that, we, we have a question. How do, how do you ensure article creators, owners understand the needs and language of the knowledge consumers? Um, I think that's, that's a constant challenge. Um, Jill and I joke constantly that our job as the, uh, the IT communications team is we translate IT into English. Um, so, you know, we work pretty steadily with, with these folks who, who write in IT and, and help them, you know, write in, in the, the consumer language and the employee language. Um, but then we've also had uh, folks come back to us and say, uh, uh, you know, this article isn't, it doesn't meet the, the consumer language. For example, you know, we have IP phones and that's what they're called and that's what we reference them. But we had somebody, one of our newer our, uh, knowledge workers come back and say, you know, employees just call these desk phones. Could we change the title of this to desk phone? And we're like, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it, it, I think it's a, a group effort to, you know, understand the needs and language of the, the consumers. And, and our employees do tell us we get, I think Melissa has it changed. We get somewhere between maybe um, six and 12, I think, you know, a half, half dozen to a dozen feedback submissions a day through articles. Is that right? Mm -hmm. or, that's great. Somewhere in there. Yeah. So, so that's a lot of interaction from our employees um, where they're pointing something out saying, hey, you know, this isn't maybe they say something like, you know, this says it's designated for all employees, but I'm in this other unit that it's not working right for me. 
Um, so then we can go and, and react or take action on that. And so as we're hearing, you know, from them, they're kind of letting us know, they, they may put feedback out there like, I don't, there's an acronym in here that I have no idea what it is. And we go, oh yeah, we got to fix that and take the acronyms out, you know? So it's just that it doesn't have to be perfect, just sufficient to solve. And so we get it out there and um, just know that a lot of times our employees are going to, you know, they're going to tell us if, if there's stuff in there they don't understand or, or need clarification on. So if it happens, we go and adjust it. So we have a question, which um, the answer is not quite, but um, it says, do you have stats on your link rate and link accuracy at the help desk? Um, mm -hmm. That is one of the lessons learned when we were setting up our technology. Uh, Jill and I had the, the certification. We were you know, completely sold in the methodology, uh, but our developers weren't quite clear on what we were trying to accomplish. Uh, you know, and we have since encouraged them to take our in-house training or take, um, you know, the out, a third party training uh, so that they, they better understand what our end goal is. Uh, so we're having to go back and, and, and get something that will help us with those stats for link rate and link accuracy. Um, we're manually taking a look at it. Um, we've seen a couple of cases where, you know, an article is elevated in search of where it shouldn't be. And that's because it had cases that weren't related to it or too many cases that weren't related to it attached. And we've, we've resolved that. Um, but to be able to look at it at a glance, we don't have yet. And that is one of my, my biggest goals to get, get done before the end of this year so we can. That's a really good question. And we have a, another question about um, our, our slides on our dashboard. Um, we were using the uh, Salesforce dashboard and the concierge, um, you know, the integrated reporting from there. Um, we have since migrated over to Power BI uh, and we are, are building that out right now. Um, we like Power BI because it better connects us to our employee demographics. So we can now see um, we have various business units, so we can see what one business unit is searching for um, compared to what another one is. Um, we can look at what one country is looking at compared to what another country is, um, which has given us some pretty good insight in you know, where we have knowledge gaps and where we don't have knowledge gaps. Uh, so highly recommend Power BI when it comes to connecting your, your, your knowledge inf uh, metrics with your employee demographics or your if, if you have access to your knowledge consumer demographics. And then we've got a question. Do you find managers also need to be trained to go from activity-based measures to outcome-based measures? I would say yes. Um, Jill, do you have any, any insight in some of the training that you've done when it comes to bringing managers in so they better understand what we're trying to do? Um, yeah, I, I just see if you can get them to, to get trained up. I mean, even if they could take that one day fundamentals KCS class or, um, you know, just what we have developed is a, an overview presentation that we give to managers to just kind of say, hey, we're gonna start, you know, working with your team and we wanna solicit them to be a part of this program. And so, um, you know, we, we just want them to go in eyes wide open and understand the, the methodology and understand um, the ask for training and things like that. And so usually once we present our little slide deck, which you know, is, is just something you could put together to, to be able to, you know, consistently show managers every time you, you can reach out and meet with them, um, then they're usually on board and they're all in and they're like, yeah, that sounds great. And then we have to say, oh yeah, and we want you to take the training too from us, you know? So um, just if you can get them to in, invest in at any level, even if they can just take one intro course, you know, just kind of a one-on-one class that you build in-house that is an hour where you can kind of just show them how it's working and how um, the, the knowledge workers will be interfacing with 
the program and the tools, you know, so that they start understanding some of the terms they're going to hear and um, uh, they can see the end goal about putting that content out there and so that it's, it's okay with them. They understand there's going to be a little time investment from some of their folks, but that in the long run, it makes sense to do it. It's, you know, it, this, this for sure, this program is not an overnight thing. It's a, it's a paradigm shift as we, you probably have already discovered. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a culture shift for kind of how we work. And so it's time to, oh, you know, just like take a deep breath and be ready. Okay. This is, this is, um, what do they say? It's a, um, marathon, not a sprint, right? You're in this for the long haul. You're going to be having lots of conversations. You probably need to build yourself a few slide decks so that you can pull those out, you know, to the right audiences about the right level of, of information that they need, stuff like that. But, you know, it's, it's just one of those things where you, you commit to this and, and you get going and you're, you know, you do what you can. All right. Do we I'm have other? Certain I miss. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Melissa. Yeah, I'm certain I missed some in the scroll. But if you guys want to add any more, if, if I didn't answer your question earlier, you know, please add it back here, and we'll get to it if if you need. And Armfin, when we were talking um, to prepare for this, you actually had some really good questions and observations too. Do you do you feel like there was anything that um, we should? reiterate or that I know. Oh. Yeah, I just would like to, uh, I, I thought this was fascinating, your journey and your focus on the portal as the voice of the customer. And uh, we see many companies that might look at their searches and searches with no results, maybe on a, a monthly basis, et cetera. And you're looking to do it um, twice a day now, right? <laughs> it's optimal. And uh, having that as a draw where uh, it was a great your example of how you would be monitoring the searches and seeing another group that wasn't yet participating in your program and reaching out and say, hey, we have demand and uh, we'd like to get you engaged and here are the rules of engagement. And uh, I thought that was fascinating. And I think a, a good lesson for others to that the portal a lot of people look at it more of a, a case focused uh, knowledge as, a, uh, as um, a byproduct of the case. And it's really knowledge of the by, byproduct of the interaction and that portal and the search results in that interaction. And then also the feedback that you get on your articles and how quickly you turn those around. And it's amazing how much as a result of that, how the, the engagement you have with your consumers, your employees, getting clarifying questions if, if need be and telling them here's the action that you took as a result of the feedback and you're just getting tremendous uh, amount of feedback as a result of that. So I thought, I mean, a lot of great lessons learned in this, but um, I think the having the focus on the portal as that voice of the customer and being very attentive to your employees through that channel, I think is a, a great uh, lesson for others. Well, cool. yeah, I, I think it's it's maybe a little bit unique that we're using um, the methodology for in-house support, really, for the employee base versus, you know, products or services that is on the agenda down the road um, to, to take this out for Parsons to leverage to our, our true customers, like the employees are our customers as knowledge program managers but for Parsons customers to have this type of thing out, um, you know, is, is also one of the, the future enhancements as well. So this was maybe, maybe a little bit more of a unique way to use the methodology, <laughs> but sure is working good for us. Oh, that's great. I mean, we see many companies that we see KCS deployed, certainly in customer support, but more and more and more uh, through internal support and not just IT, but HR. It's been great to see what you have with securities, facilities, et cetera. But we yeah. see that 
really happening more and more of KCS deployment in the enterprise. And I think you gave a great example of how to, to make that happen. Good. Well, I think we're, we're timing out. So thank you all very much for participating. And thank you to um, Jill and Melissa for the great work and um, really appreciate it. And again, uh, we have uh, lots of um, webinars coming up in the next few months. So please take a look at those events and we look forward to seeing you again in the future event. So thanks again, really appreciate it. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks for having us today. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.